Forbes Field, where the Pittsburgh Pirates used to play baseball, was in the Oakland neighborhood about three miles east of downtown, between the University of Pittsburgh and the rolling hills of Shenley Park. As a landmark, it's meant different things to different people. For some, it was just a distant glow on the city's horizon on late summer evenings. For my friend Lou, it was a place to sell newspapers. Read it now, sit on it later, he'd call out to the fans entering evening games. For one of my professors who hated baseball, it was just that irksome location in the city where the traffic used to snarl when the streetcars lined up as the games let out. And for still others, even in its absence, it remains the nearly sacred ground where Bill Mazeroski hit his ninth inning home run to win the 1960 World Series against the New York Yankees. And where, to this day, near a remnant of the outfield wall, on the anniversary of that event each October 13th, fans still gather to listen to rebroadcasts of the play-by-play. For me, it was once the center of my life. My former wife Meg and I lived across the street from 1967 to 1970, and it was where our first daughter, Laura, was born. We lived on the ground floor of a duplex up a steep climb of steps along South Bouquet Street and directly across from the player's entrance. The grandstand was close enough that fans taking breaks along the outside rail between innings could call down to us from across the street when we sat on our porch, and sometimes they even used to insult our upstairs neighbors, John and Laura and Chucky, when they built a tabletop Buddhist shrine on their porch and lit incense candles. They were up high enough to see over the rim of the lower grandstand and under the upper deck truss all the way to second base. When we used to join them on their second floor porch, we could catch the turning of the occasional double play, Gene Alley to Bill Mazeroski, and a throw to first base cropped from view by the back of a refreshment stand. From our porch downstairs, we relied on an even more fragmented sense of a game's progress based on sound alone. It was a deceptive indicator. Saturday afternoon promotions would pack the nearby right field stands with thousands of Cub Scouts who would cheer every routine ground ball. In those years, South Bouquet Street was fast becoming a student ghetto for the nearby University of Pittsburgh, but it still had some of the flavor of the first-generation Italian neighborhood it had once been. At the end of the street, the Julius Way city steps led down into the Junction Hollow neighborhood where Meg and I often took evening walks and where we still heard Italian. This steeply sloped neighborhood had been built all at once in the last decade of the 19th century when many from the towns of Pizzoferrato and Gambarale in the Abruzzi region emigrated to the United States. Up where we lived on the plateau top, our neighbors were from L'Aquila near Rome. Longer evening walks took us over to Atwood Street, which had comfortable street-level porches and an odd church with a center bell tower. Sign of the changing demographic of the neighborhood, it was the first church I knew that was transformed into a restaurant. Then we would circle back home by way of Forbes Avenue under the shadow of the Iroquois building with its fabulous bay windows and many dentists' offices upstairs. The corner had two drugstores and a nearby newsstand called Gus Miller's. Myrtle May, the woman behind the counter, kept her hair pulled back severely and then up into a tall bouffant. Pittsburghers called it high hair. That, and her shrill voice, gave her the authority to shoo the boys from nearby Central Catholic High School away from the newly arrived issues of Playboy magazine. Further up the street at the corner with South Bouquet, where the streetcar stopped, were a white tower, the Oakland Original selling footlong hot dogs, and a steak and cocktail restaurant called Frankie Gustine's, where some friends took me the night Laura was born. Started by a former Pirates infielder, it looked like Pittsburgh's version of New York's Sardis, with high-backed leather seating along both walls. Its walls were lined with framed and signed photographs of Pittsburgh sports figures. After a game, you could run into sports columnists talking about the evening's play before filing their final copy. But it wasn't just baseball that Forbes Field housed. 
One midsummer Saturday morning, we were awakened by the roaring of tigers and the trumpeting of elephants. The annual police circus had arrived through the night. Later that afternoon, Meg and I were able to get in through an open gate and found an outfield filled with circus wagons and artists practicing their acts. Even though it was nearly a mile away by the river, the Jones and Lachlan mills that lined both banks were never out of our consciousness. Many of Oakland's residents worked in the inferno that was those mills. Each morning, there was a covering of soot that lined the windowsill of every window in our apartment. Each year when October came, the great ballpark looming overhead would go dormant. And then the winter would bring us rats. These were fearless vermin grown huge and ravenous on a summer of ballpark hot dogs and cracker jacks. Often each winter, I descended to the basement in knee-high boots and armed with a tennis racket to battle them as they hissed at me from atop the central beam while Meg would load the washing machine. But when I think of our apartment on South Bouquet Street, it is the summer evenings on the porch opposite Forbes Field that come mostly to mind. We had two rocking chairs, a round table for mugs of beer, and a radio for KDKA's Bob Prince and Jim Woods to keep us up with the progress of the game. I had built a purple hanging swing for Laura, and she was content to sit and get drowsy as I rocked her while we listened to the game. There was a band of young kids who used to gather in the street at the base of our steps waiting for foul balls to come over the grandstand. Bob Prince would alert them by radio if one was on the way over the grandstand roof. It was important for them to know who had hit the ball because one from a star player like Willie Mays or Roberto Clemente would fetch a higher price. Usually these balls would land on the tarmac, but sometimes on the roof of an unlucky car and then, with high arching bounces, would lead the band of boys on a chase down Bouquet Street and sometimes all the way down Jean Carré Street to the valley floor. Once, and only once, did a ball land on our porch. I was alone in my rocker one evening, enjoying a beer and listening to Bob Prince announce the game, so I had advanced warning. I looked up as the ball flew out of the glow of the light standards overhead and landed right beside me where it rattled back and forth between the house and the brick parapet wall. I took my time. I considered the ball mine already, a gift from God, and much welcomed because in all the years I had attended, I had never once caught a major league ball. I put my beer down and went over to the ball which was by now rolling towards the steps. But just as I leaned over to pick it up, a hand from one of the street boys hooked around the parapet wall and grabbed the ball away. Each evening, the ritual singing of Take Me Out to the Ball Game would alert us when the game had reached the seventh inning stretch and the pirates had opened the bleacher gate so fans could exit easily. If the game was still close, we would gather up Laura from her bed put her into a basket where she would continue to sleep soundly and head over to the bleachers for the several innings that remained. The left field bleachers were a wonderful place to view a game. They were close to the action because they paralleled the third baseline. It was on one of these late night free visits to Forbes Field that we witnessed Roberto Clemente make an errant throw. Usually when I think of Roberto Clemente, I think of the cat-like precision with which he prepared to face the pitcher. He stood unusually far away from home plate and always pawed at the same place at the corner of the batter's box between pitches. But if there's a single play I remember, it is this one errant throw. It was the only error I ever saw him make. Someone hit a long drive deep into right center field. Clemente caught up with it on perhaps the third bounce at the 436-foot sign near the outfield exit gate. And then, in one motion, he whirled and threw toward third base. Clemente threw almost straight-armed, as if throwing a javelin, and his throw started out on a low line, but then it started to rise, and it kept on rising, over the third baseman's head, over the coach's head, over the dugout, and far up into the stands, still rising and rising with an energy internal. 
The runner trotted home. No one clapped. No one booed. There was simply amazed silence. No one had known a thrown baseball could travel that far. There were also interesting bleacher regulars. There was the man who ran the scoreboard. On hot days inside that south-facing green metal oven, he was often visible, stripped down to his underwear through the opening of an as yet unrecorded inning. There was the bald man and his wife who ran the food concession. It was an informal operation, just a terrace cooker for hot dogs and several stacked cases of Coca-Cola. The bleachers had a culture apart from the rest of Forbes Field. Between innings, the regular left fielder, Willie Stargell, would often come over and talk to the bald guy manning his hot dog stand. One evening, when there were only a few fans in the bleachers, my sister Pam and her husband Michelle joined us for a game. Late in the game, the ladies both lit up cigars. This got quite a lot of attention from the players in the San Francisco Giants bullpen. When we would take Laura to night games, she would occasionally wake up, and her outstretched arm or foot would startle the bald man who had assumed our basket on the bench was a picnic dinner. There was a sequence to the life of the neighborhood around each evening's game. About three hours before game time, the players began arriving. Most of them parked in a lot under the right field stands and walked up the long slope to the players' entrance across from us. During the three years we lived on Bouquet Street, 1967 to 1970, the pirates dropped their dress code and the players began to dress more self-expressively. It was, after all, the late 1960s, and so their walk up the hill evolved into a fashion runway for those of us viewing the scene from porches above. Lots of bell-bottoms and colorful shirts. Doc Ellis, who would later become infamous for pitching a no-hitter while on LSD, got the most commentary from Chi-Chi's dad sitting on the porch next door. It was his pink suits and high pump shoes. Ma lui, che abito fantastico, he'd say in amazement. One day, Elroy Face came up the hill carrying a carpenter's handsaw. It was a different time then. Players had to work off-season, and Elroy worked as a carpenter. Roberto Clemente remained a classic dresser in perfectly tailored suits, the most handsome man God ever made. Then came the gathering crowd, a hush, the national anthem, and the booming voice of Art McKennon announcing the lineups and the game itself. A few minutes after the game, a bus would pull up outside the players' entrance and wait for half an hour to pick up the visiting team for the trip back to the nearby Webster Hall Hotel. The engine was kept running to keep the air conditioning up and a crowd seeking autographs would gather. Sometimes I would go across the street myself to wait for a close-up of the visiting players and their groupies under the heat wash of the bus's air conditioner exhaust. The park didn't close down completely until well into the night when the cleanup crew was done sweeping away the peanut shells and the last cup had been crushed underfoot. Epilogue. If my memory of Forbes Field is that of a spectator of all of its ongoing life, its meaning was different for a man I got to know many years later. For him, it was not just a place to watch, it was the object of a life's desire. In 1991, I was working on a mural project and had engaged people at a senior center called Vintage to help me bring memories of individuals into the mural. One day at the center, I met the former center fielder of the Pittsburgh Crawfords, one of the legendary teams of the Negro Baseball League. Almost 90 years old by this time, Reverend Harold Tinker had retained his full height he was wearing a clerical collar and had a narrow face with prominent cheekbones. When he stood up to greet me, I noticed how bowed his legs were, and then I noticed his hands, which were huge. And in the center of his left hand was a baseball-sized pocket worn into his palm by 30 years of catching fly balls. Reverend Tinker's father had brought his family to Pittsburgh from Birmingham, Alabama in 1916 during the World War I production boom. 1917 was the last year Honus Wagner played for the Pirates 
and he remembered sneaking into Forbes Field several times through the board fence behind the bleachers to see him play. Though he longed to do so, being African-American, he had never expected to play there himself. He first joined the Pittsburgh Crawfords in the mid-1920s when they were still a semi-pro team. They were just one of several teams he joined on top of his regular job with RKO Film. But in the late 1920s, with the addition of players such as Josh Gibson, the team grew stronger. Gibson would go on to a legendary career with the Crawfords and later the Homestead Grays. He was called the Black Babe Ruth. But it was Harold Tinker who originally discovered him hitting monstrous home runs at a field on Spring Hill and brought him to the Crawfords. By the summer of 1930, the Crawfords were ready to challenge the Homestead Grays, Pittsburgh's nationally known black team. The game was not played at the Crawfords' home field on the hill. It was played on August 25th in Forbes Field, where Tinker had assumed he would never play. Tinker described the game while I acted as scribe. The Crawfords were not favored. Gibson had jumped to the Grays several days before, but the game remained close. Grays pitcher Oscar Owens held the Crawfords hitless through five innings until Tinker hit safely in the sixth. Though the Crawfords scored two runs that inning, they entered the ninth inning still down by a run. They finally lost by a 3-2 margin when Bill Harris made a running catch of Charlie Hughes's line drive with two outs and two runners on base. After Reverend Tinker finished describing the game, I drew a baseball diamond on a sheet of paper and asked him to list the players at each position. He named all but one. On the field that day were three future Hall of Fame players, Judy Johnson, Oscar Charleston, and Josh Gibson. 